So welcome back to Everything Marketplaces, where we talk with founders and leaders from some of today's top marketplaces. So this is episode 88, which is a really great group chat that we just had with Zach Onisco, who's the CEO of Dribbble. So most of you are probably familiar with Dribbble as it's a leading community for designers and creatives to share their work and get hired. So prior to Dribbble, Zach was in executive roles at Creative Market, Autodesk, and Hired. So some really incredible marketplace experience. So this is a really great chat with Zach, where we got to learn more about his past experience leading top marketplaces in the creative and hiring space. Now also CEO of Dribble, some unique insights, and also had a great Q&A for those on the chat. So I really enjoyed this conversation, and now you're going to find it a great watch to the end. So Zach, welcome to the group chat. It's definitely a real treat to have you uh, join us here today. So you have some really incredible experience at top marketplaces like uh, Creative Market, Autodesk, and uh, Hired, in addition to now being a CEO of Dribbble. So I'm really excited to uh, dive into things with you and uh, learn more about it. Before we jump into things, though, I think it might be great if you can start off by sharing a little bit more on your background and, uh, you know, what led you to the world of marketplaces for those that might not know you? Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think marketplace is, uh, you know, one model but it just happened to be what's happened over time um you know i I think to even go back further you know i started my career as a designer um and uh my did freelancing for a few years out of high school then went to college and got a design degree and then decided i wasn't ready to join the workforce and started an MBA program and then got a job at a startup and then dropped out of the MBA program and uh, and kind of moved around and and started to do multiple functions other than design, moved into product management, to growth roles, and and ultimately to executive roles over the years. Um, And my my career path has kind of flip-flopped in like two categories. I'd say, you know, the recruitment space and then the design space um that that first job out of college was a company called tickle which was uh a testing platform and we were actually a a studio of sorts that did a few different businesses uh but we sold that business to monster.com way back uh in the early 2000s um for a little over 100 million um and then stayed on there for a few years and then joined a a, and, and you know you kind of think of monster and, and and even like the testing platform is, is a bit of a two-sided marketplace but not really kind of a stretch there but um you know after i left monster i started a company with one of the tickle founders uh called branch out um which was really trying to build linkedin on the facebook graph in the early days of of the the facebook api and then did that for, for a few years, was there about five years and, uh, you know, had a good run. We, I ran the growth team there and, um, and we grew it to like 30 million users in, in like three months uh, during that kind of the peak there. I had some really high growth, crazy stories with, with that experience. Um, and then after that, I left and joined a company called Creative Markets. So that's kind of starts my journey here at Dribbble. Um, Joined Creative Market as Chief Growth Officer in 2012 and um, and really was, you know, joined the team uh, with, with the founding team and uh, really kind of the, at the start of the, of the marketplace and, you know, had a good experience growing, you know, that from kind of zero to, um, to a pretty fast growth. We did, we did, uh, a million bucks our first year somewhere around there and um and then shortly after in 2014 we had uh offers to join uh a couple big public companies and one of them was autodesk and we uh we took that uh offer and um creative market joined autodesk and then in uh 2017 i joined dribble as ceo and then bring things kind of full circle uh in 2020, Dribble acquired Creative Market, um, and so now uh, it's uh, it's part of the Dribble portfolio, uh, which has been a lot of fun. So we've, um, you know, the story with Creative Market was, uh, you know, Autodesk um, 
Credit Market was had the opportunity to spin out of Autodesk and become an independent startup again, and uh, and and we we bought it. Uh, anyway, it, it, really really interesting story there, but um, yeah. So yeah, that, that's kind of my my career in a nutshell. That kind of takes us to today, but um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's quite the uh, career path, and uh, yeah, that's a cool cool story about everything coming full circle now. You know, I guess so. Kind of like going back though to you know uh, creative market when you were there and leading growth. You know, what was uh like what was your experience there leading growth? And you know, at that time, like what was like the growth kind of like mindset and maybe approach like? Yeah, so I mean, I think there was um, you know with with any marketplace, there's always this kind of cart before the horse. You have this two sided problem to solve, and so. Um, you know, the, we wanted to lure, uh, designers to create a market, to sell their wares before there was a customer base. Right. So really hard proposition to, uh, by the way, we actually acquired a lot of designers from dribble in, that, in those early days, which is funny. Um, but, um, the, uh, the funny thing with creative market, so the, the founders went through Y Combinator with a different business. So they had a, a platform called Color Lovers, which was a community for color palettes and patterns and, and this sort of thing. And went in Y Combinator with that, and then Creative Market came out the other side. And you know, through that experience, they decided they wanted to build this, this multi-categorial design asset, digital file marketplace. Um, but with that, to build it, you know, and so it's going to take a year to actually build the scaffolding to, to run this marketplace. And so in that time, that splash page and they marketed that splash page to the, the color lovers audience. So we did have that going for us. Um, we did some other, uh, interesting hacks where, um, the, the team from color lovers made a a little app for customizing your, your Twitter profile. And, uh, and then we uh, just shot an email or a tweet. I forget the, how we contacted Evan Williams at the time, but you know, he liked it so much. He just put it on the settings page on Twitter and that sent a bunch of traffic back to us. So we had some, some interesting lead kind of lead gen, this pool of, people that we could market to in the early days to tell them about creative market. Okay. And then we have this splash page on creative market and within like a, probably a six to 12 month span, we experimented with a bunch of different offers on that splash page to try to get people to sign up. And so the original idea was, you know, that you get five bucks and free credits. Then we were like, did the $5, give $5. We did a couple things. And then, um, and then we reached out to some early sellers in the marketplace and said, Hey, why don't you set, set some of your goods for free? We'll bundle them up and we'll give them the way to, to people as an acquisition um, uh, hook to try to get people to sign up. And that's when we kind of had this like a little inflection point. And then we had like, you know, 50,000 people sign up in a short amount of time, something like that. And, uh, and with that, then we can go to sellers and we're like, Hey, there's, 50,000 potential customers here on our new marketplace. You should bring some assets over and sell with us. And uh, it sounds easier than, <laughs> than in reality. Uh, it, it was more laborious than that. But uh, but anyway, that's kind of the story of how we got the, the marketplace off the ground and had a balance of uh, buyers and sellers on, on day one when we opened up shop. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely uh, easier to, uh, you know, just think about it and, uh, you know, look back, but, uh, but that's great. Yeah. Thanks for sharing with us on that. You know, so maybe what were some uh, kind of like unique challenges with it, you know, as, as you guys kind of began to scale. So I think the scaling part, you know, um, once we, um, once we started to get going and it was, it was really cool. Like we made, you know, 200 bucks on our first day and it was really easy to just watch that, you know, that revenue chart, you know, one of the beautiful things about, you know, our business is that it's this um, ever expanding catalog of uh, inventory that never goes out of stock. There's no warehouse to fill. It's just, you know, uh, 
And, um, you know, and so with that, I think that the challenges were always on the customer side, right? So we had shops, we actually had an application process, which we used for quality control. We really wanted only the best products on creative market. And so um, we had a long, you know, application list in the early days of folks who wanted to sell with us. We kind of just let the, the best of the best in. So that made the catalog very high quality and alluring to customers. And, um, and it looked really cool within the design community. Yeah, so telling people about it, you know, people were excited and genuinely, you know, interested in what we're building. Um, and then so from a growth role, which was kind of part product, part marketing, um, really just taking like a multi-channel approach and we just planted seeds and experimented with a bunch of different tactics and, and experiments to see which one of those seeds would, would sprout and start to grow. And once you start, you know, a channel sprout, then you would shift focus and pivot and, and give that seedling more, more energy and more sunlight and more water, you know? Um, but no, I mean, in the early days, there was lots of, you know, guest post trading, a lot of hustling, a lot of manual, um, manual outreach um, on the shop side. We, um, you know, we really wanted to get the sellers in the platform really excited to sell with us. And so um, one thing we did is we had these really nice, um, you know, kind of like 50 pound paperweight, like cotton letter pressed with uh, our logo uh, embossed on, on this billfold. And then we'd put a crisp dollar bill inside and we'd write a handwritten note to every seller when they made their first dollar on our marketplace. And we'd send it, you know, all around the world um, until we got a, a cease and desist letter from the postmaster general because it's, uh, uh, we didn't know it was illegal to send uh, US currency in the mail. But, uh, but those little things we did, you know, lots of, lots of uh, in-person events, um, you know, very early on, 2012, 2013, um, we co uh, dribble and create a market partner together, even back then on like co-hosting South by Southwest parties and, and different, uh, you know, we do dribble meetups and um, just different things to kind of get on the ground level and, and rub elbows with our community and, and just kind of understand their needs and, you know, and that kind of just shaped the product roadmap over the years. Yeah. Thanks for uh, sharing with us. Definitely. It uh, sounds like you take a, or have taken a very, uh, you know, community driven approach, um, you know, at creative market and uh, also at dribble now, which I definitely wanted to uh, jump into, you know, so, so what, uh, what, what's the uh, story behind, you know, you, uh, you joining uh, dribble as a CEO? Well, I mean, like I said, you know, Dan and Rich, the, the co-founders of Dribbble, um, we had a relationship going way back from the early creative market days, um, you know, 2012, 2013 era. And, you know, every time those guys would come out to San Francisco, they would stop by our office, we'd grab dinner. And so it was really kind of a, an opportunity of, you know, they were looking for like the business guy to join, you know, Dan's a designer, Rich was the, the engineer. And, um, and so they were looking for, for someone to take over the operations. And so I threw my hat in the ring and, and, uh, I think that relationship made it a nice soft landing. Um, that was also around the time where Dan and Rich sold the majority of their ownership in the business to tiny, uh, capital, which is now tiny capital back then it was just tiny, um, who are the guys who who are behind Meta Lab and that's the design agency who designed Slack and Uber Eats and a bunch of cool cool apps. Um, so yeah, I mean that's you know honestly like you know I was I was at a company called Hired um, previously and I think um, you know it was uh, I want to say October or November. I got the offer to join Dribble, and I just immediately quit my other job. I'm like, this is this is my dream job. I have to take this, and 
I didn't even get the, I didn't officially start until like the middle of January or something the next year. But um, I was like, this is, this is it. This is my calling. So, yeah. Yeah, certainly. That's, it's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing company. So most of us here, uh, you know, do, do know about Dribble. I guess so. For those that don't, though, you know, could you give us kind of like a high level overview of you know Dribble and uh, maybe even uh, you know touch on some unique aspects of it as a business? Yeah. So I think the interesting thing about Dribble is it's evolved quite a bit. Um, we're going to celebrate 13 years this summer. Um, originally, Dribble was uh, a platform. Uh, for show and tell for designers. Um, Dan, our, our co-founder, Dan at Cedar Home was uh, in the early 2000s, uh, authored books on web design and was, was touring around the design conference scene and you know, at these design conference was peering over the shoulders of other you know, celebrity designers and was asking, what are you working on? And so that's the origin story of, of Dribble. Uh, but over the last decade, it's really evolved to become this uh, this kind of professional network for designers, right? It's a place where designers can showcase their work and get feedback from peers, uh, but also, you know, build an audience and, and uh, get exposure for their work and ultimately find their next freelance or full-time job on our platform. So um, fast forward today, we've helped... Uh, you know, 55,000 plus brands build their design teams on Dribbble. So we have a very active uh, recruitment business, uh, a hiring solutions business. Um, we have a, an advertising business. We have an education business. We have a marketplace business uh, with Creative Market. And we also have a, a, a portfolio business with, with Dribbble Pro. How are you kind of like managing that as like a team? You know, what's your team size like and uh, like work structure? Um, so it's changed, you know, quite a bit over the years. So I, I took over the company. It was eight people. Um, now we're probably close to 90. Um, and then, you know, funny enough, in, in, in 2019, I was invited to Bali to speak at the running remote conference because we were, um, you know, we were this platform with, with millions of users. And at the time we we're like 40 or 50 employees, um, but we're fully remote. So we're fully distributed over the US and, and all across the US and Canada. And we've never had uh, an office and we've, we've really had remote as part of our DNA since the very beginning. So, um, so that's a core piece of, of, of how we work. How we're organized is, is pretty typical, right? I think we have, we'd have the, the functions that you would expect from product engineering, design, sales, marketing, et cetera. Yeah, I know I was uh, doing some kind of uh, research before our chat and uh, I, I saw some previous, um, you know, conversations with you and it was uh, highlighting the, the remote aspect, so. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, you know, the, we were, we were remote by design from the early days. So I, mean, I remember taking over the company and I was visiting one of our employees in Oakland. I remember chatting, like we should get, an office space out here and we'll get all like the cool furniture and deck it out. It'll be like, you know, designed to the T, um, you know, and then you just, you start to look at real estate prices and you get locked into five, seven, 10 year leases. And like, maybe we should just try this remote thing as long as we can until it breaks. And, you know, here we are 13 years later and it hasn't broke. So, and now everyone else is remote and they're like, oh, this is actually pretty great. Yeah, certainly. Def definitely, uh, you know, something obviously now like a trend. To, you know, another one, too, as far as, you know, a shift, uh, I guess, from being, um, you know, more designers from, you know, full time to, uh, you know, I would say to, to consulting um, and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, is, is that something, you know, that you've seen on your end and you're kind of, uh, you know, gearing up around or? Yeah, I mean, design is, a, is an interesting function, right? I think it's probably the only. So 70 percent of our community is freelance the last six months. And that's regardless of if they're at full-time jobs, full-time uh, in-house gigs, or if they're full-time independent. And I think it's just because of the nature of design, you want to keep your, your skills up to date. Uh, you might want to keep your portfolio uh, diversified and well-rounded. You want to, you know, just try new things to, to keep your skills sharp. And so, um, yeah, we, we did see uh, a shift but to be honest, no, we've also seen like a massive 
uh, just increase in demand across the, the board in the last, you know, probably like probably in the last four to five years, but in particular, like the last two years, we've seen a pretty massive shift in demand for, for design just in general, just the function, right? And I think that's, you know, in large aspect, it's just because the, I think the, the startup economy, the, the, the landscape is getting, uh, it's more crowded. There's just a lot more startups than there were before. And as technology kind of flattens the competitive landscape, design is really how companies are starting to differentiate by building, excuse me, building a better user experience, building a better product, right? That's how you win over customers and, um, and, and retain them. So yeah, we're just starting to see like just a ton of investment um, across the board and not just kind of the, the Silicon Valley Airbnbs or the, the Dropboxes or the, you know, the Googles as you'd expect, but like, you know, really starting to see it across, you know, Capital One, McDonald's, Ford Motor Company, like a lot of big Fortune 100s uh, are, are hiring at a much faster rate than ever before. Yeah, certainly. And so, so you did mention, you know, hiring is, uh, you know, one kind of uh, aspect of your business. So um, could you maybe share a little bit more about that? It's funny. We, we've, we're always a network at our heart, right? We were this community first and, you know, over the years we just kind of looked like, well, how can we make money off this thing that we enjoy building so much? And, you know, we kind of looked around and other networks were like really advertising led, you know, from the Facebooks or the Snapchats, the Pinterest, you know, of the world, we're like hundred percent advertising, um, which, you know, we're, much smaller scale than those guys too. So it didn't make, so we do have an advertising business, but it's, it's pretty, uh, it, it's pretty small scale. Um, and so we looked at other ways to make money. And so, you know, one of the ways that over the years, we really looked at LinkedIn. Um, well, one on like the, the comparison is that, you know, LinkedIn's done a great job making a LinkedIn profile synonymous with a re resume we've always kind of had the ambition to make the triple profile synonymous with a portfolio. And so, um, again, we're kind of going through this evolution. Um, there's a pretty big, uh, investment, uh, change happening to the dribble profile happening this quarter, uh, the next couple of weeks. Um, so that'll be exciting, but, um, really want to invest in dribble being the place where we're creatives, build their portfolio and build an audience around their work. And then from there, also LinkedIn has a very active job board and, and a, you know, uh, a recruitment search product. You know, we, we kind of looked at that as we were coming up and mirrored some of those mechanics. So we have, you know, today our, our hiring solutions is probably, you know, the, the number one channel where hiring managers hire creatives in the world. At this point, um, it's, it's at significant scale. Um, you know, highly active job board uh, and, and search product. So, yeah, designers build their build their portfolios on Dribble, then hire managers search Dribble to find them. Yeah, and I believe did you guys uh, acquire WeWork uh, remotely also? Or uh, yeah, so that was that was a funny one. Um, so our parents. Uh, Tiny bought WeWork remotely and we operated it for about a year um, before we found somebody to kind of take it over. And, you know, we were kind of fully focused on Dribbble. Um, you know, we, we took it over from the 37 Signals guys and, and got it in pretty good shape and then, uh, you know, found the new, new CEO to take it over. So now that's kind of run outside of the Dribbble business. Um, but we haven't made some acquisitions. We bought uh, we bought a company called Crew uh, from Unsplash, which is now part of Getty Images. Um, and uh, that was in 2017. And we ran that business for about a year, year and a half before folding it into what is now Dribble Hiring. Uh, I mentioned we bought Creative Market in, in 2020. And then uh, about two weeks ago, we bought a marketplace called FontSpring, which, you know, with, with, Creative Market and Font Spring and Dribble now put together were the second largest font business in the world. So that's been a fun one. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, we actually had a uh, Michael Cho from uh, Unsplash as a group chat guest uh, last yeah. year, so he, he's awesome. Yeah, um, that's great. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I would love to learn a little bit more about, you know, what, uh, you know, I guess around like your strategy or even just, you know, an example of one kind of uh, maybe acquisition, you know, um, what goes into like all the different like kind of decision making factors of, you know, like uh, maybe even like build versus kind of acquire? I think it's just that, right? So I think it's a build versus buy uh, analysis in the beginning. I think that um, in the last uh, couple of years, um, you know, the market's just been very frothy. And I think that's pushed us away from getting too aggressive. We've been very active. So I think since we closed the creative market deal, we probably sent out um, I don't know, probably like 10 LOIs, uh, but we're, we're very disciplined and not overpaying. You know, I think that's, that's the key is that we, um, you know, we, we look at an opportunity and, and really break it down to that math of like, could we build this uh, ourselves internally, invest R and D dollars to go build this idea or, you know, and start from zero. And then, you know, how many months would it take before we, you know, make our first dollar and then has that first dollar scale into the first hundred dollars or whatever. Um, and we kind of weigh that against, you know, here's this great brand. Um, a lot of times it's founders who've been at it for like, you know, eight, 10 years, and they're just looking to do something else. And so, you know, they're looking to, you know, pass it off, uh, pass an opportunity off to, to, to a good home and um, into a team who they can trust to, you know, to run their baby without messing it up. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's that it's like, you know, the opportunity is like, okay, here's this thing that's already at scale, already has a customer base, already is making money. Um, we tend to only look at properties that are profitable. Um, we're, we're still talking with bootstraps. So we've never taken outside, uh, capital and, uh, a raised VC. So that's, just kept us very disciplined in how we operate the business and how we look at the landscape. But, um, but we, we are, we do have a strong appetite for, for m a because we have this hyper engaged community at, at the heart of our business. Right. And we have this, this inherent social network that, um, that makes a logical foundation to bolt on other verticalized businesses and in turn add more value back to our community, right? By, by layering on these new businesses. With Creative Market, for example, you know, we, you know, as friends with the, the founders over the years and, and stayed in touch after I, I joined Dribble. And one of the first things I discovered with Dribble is that there was just a ton of traffic for design assets, right? And it was a product that we didn't serve our audience. And so it was kind of a conversation of like, guys, we need to merge, we need to, uh, or we're going to end up building our own marketplace. And, and uh, so long story short, that, that, that one probably took us, uh, you know, two, three years or something to close um, soup to nuts. So it's, it's, it's a lot of work. m and is not easy. Um, like I said, we've put a lot of offers out. We've got outbid by companies like Adobe and Canva and Shutterstock and, and folks that are way, way bigger than us, but we're out there. We're talking all the same, same folks. Yeah, definitely. That speaks to, you know, the power of community once you kind of have, you know, have the foundation of a community kind of in place and, you know, some of the uh, different opportunities and kind of come from that. So, uh, you know, yeah. on, on that note too, you know, uh, I guess for, for those of us uh, here that are like early stage marketplace founders, or, you know, might be watching the recording um, yeah. that are really thinking about, you know, how they can, uh, I think, prioritize and focus on building uh, community first or community driven marketplaces. You know, what are some tips uh, that you might, uh, you know, be able to share with us? you know, on that end of, you know, how you've really kind of put the community first with Dribble. I think it's, it's really just trying to distill it back to value, right? Like how do you add value to people, right? How do they, you know, no one's going to use a service unless the service delivers outsized value, and especially if there's a paid component, right? Even if, even free products need to deliver outsized value. And so we've really just had that perspective to everything that we make, right? It's like, how do we return value back to our community? Um, our mission, like everything is, is really centered around, you know, we want to build stuff that makes designers successful. We want to make, we want to build products that 
allow creatives to make a living doing what they love, right? And so that's, you know, from novice to intermediate to seasoned pro to entrepreneur, like we've, we've invested in different projects, either, you know, education, we just launched uh, workshops, which is funny because we, we had a conference business uh, for a few years and then with the pandemic that that shut down and um, we had a, a really cool live workshop thing we did where we brought these you know amazing celebrity designers that would do these like hands-on intimate workshops with a small group we did that live at, at our conference and we decided to uh you know let's see if we can bring this online and and so we did that and it's you know these workshops have been selling out and then, um, and then, you know, next up we're launching a, a full course. We're talking to some of the top design schools in the world of partnering to certify some of these courses. So we're, we're kind of early days. Um, but education is, is a big area of focus for us. Um, and then, you know, with the marketplace, we have this tool agnostic workflow solution, right? The solution to the blank canvas, or designer can, you know, you're not going to, you know, create a font for the project you're, you're building for your client. You're going to, you know, buy a font, use it in your composition. And so that's been, um, and then, you know, the, the por portfolio network with Dribble, that's really about building an audience and, and getting your work in front of potential, you know, clients. Um, and then the, the hiring solution connects the dots there from from beginning to, to close there so you know in an essence we're, we're really want to build this kind of one-stop shop this you know the center of the universe for the design community at dribble we're part yeah. of the way there yeah yeah Thir 13 years in the making right so, yeah yeah that's Just great so, off ground. yeah so we're going to get into questions here in a uh, second because we have a few. Um, sure. You know, I, I did actually want to ask uh, a, a question for you specifically. So, you know, you did mention that you are bootstrap and, you know, I'm, I'm sure over the course of the years that there's been kind of competitors in the space kind of pop up and, you know, maybe some that are even kind of venture backed, right? So, you know, how have you kind of viewed uh, competition in the space uh, given that you are bootstrap and maybe how has that kind of led to, you know, how you're, how you're operating uh, Dribble today? No, I think I like to learn from our competitors and see, you know, what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, but we've never really had, you know, we've never been faced with a huge threat from the competitive landscape because we really look at what we're doing as a market of one. because so no one's really doing what we're doing. You know, if you look at each of our business lines and you segment them, now you can look at a sea of competitors or playing in, in a tangent space, but what we're doing is really focused on, again, this, this one-stop solution to help designers at, at every point in their career journey. Um, so it's very different from Behance, which is an Adobe product they were required in 2012 or something like that, 2011. Um, it's, it's very different from, yeah. So anyway, it, it's the, the competitive landscape is fragmented. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting players in, in the, you know, in our in our landscape, and it's a very fragmented landscape, which is an opportunity for us from an M and A, right? So instead of like thinking about, you know, all the other players as competitors or threats to our business, I really look at them as as partners and and you know opportunities for you know can we join forces and and solve these problems faster together than independently. Yeah, sounds like it's uh, certainly worked out. So, with, with a few recent acquisitions, um, cool. Hey, uh, Lenny, do you uh, do you want to jump on? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Zach. That's super super useful. I have actually uh, two questions for you. One is uh, more regarding your experience. So, you've been part of different startups that actually achieve like fast growth. Uh, can you give us some tips about the acquisition channel that you've been using through different uh, startups and the one that worked the best? And the second question is how do you manage to um, how do you manage teams that work remotely so well? And what is the tips and trick that you have implemented through Dribble to make sure that everyone stays um, aware about everything's going on and maintain a strong culture within your company? Yeah, no, I think um, in terms of high growth. Um, 
you know, I think every company is different and there's no silver bullet. It's, it's always, you know, I think, you know, I think the secret to the success is like fierce prioritization. You know, if you're, if you don't have focus on what's going to really move the needle, you're just going to get watered down with too many tasks that aren't going to matter in the long run. So, no, I think that's been, you know, you look back and in, in all the different companies and, and, and there's also like moments of growth too, of, of like the sudden growth. And then there's like sustainable growth. Um, at the heart of it all though, is about delivering value back to, to users, right? People enjoy what you're, you're building and, and derive value from it. You know, at the end of the day, growth is about word of mouth. If you're building a great user experience, people naturally tell their friends and family about it, whether or not you have a sophisticated viral loop or referral program or affiliate or, or you know, spending millions of dollars in paid marketing. Um, which by the way, there's probably two or three other channels in that. So it's very, you have, you have a limited amount of channels to play with, how you leverage them and how you how you approach them is, is, is where you can get creative. And, you know, I think as long as you're really focusing in on, on your customer and how you can apply outsized value. Um, Thanks a lot. And uh, regarding the managing the remote team at Dribble, can oh, you yeah. give us some tips and tricks regarding this? Yeah. No, I mean, I think, I don't think it's anything uh, miraculous. Right. So it's like, you know, when I was at, uh, when I was at Hired, working with Aaron, hey Aaron, um, you know, we were, uh, how's it going? You know, we used all the same tools, right? It's Slack, it's Zoom, and, and at Hired, we had, you know, teams in 17 cities around the world, and, and you know, they were remote, even though we had this, this kind of mothership in San Francisco. Um, but no, I mean, I think we, you know, that, that office that we had on 11th and Market, we, you know, we paid a few million bucks a year for it. It's it's a, an expensive overhead, and then you look across this sea of people like Aaron wearing these boys nose canceling headphones, so that you can cut out the noise and distraction of the office. It was just logical of like, well, let's do this remote thing so people can actually have time to focus and do their job, um, and then you know connect on Zoom and Slack, and you know we we have processes processes in place that. Um, You know, you can kind of, you quickly can see who's pulling their weight or not, right? You can see who's contributing. Um, so I, I don't think it's very different than the same processes that you'd have in an office environment. It's just digitally. Now we, we, um, we used to have team trips once or twice a year um, that were, uh, scheduled around our design conference, which brought our entire team out. And then the team got to hang out with people from our community, which is really cool for, for the community to meet the dribble team, but also for the dribble team to meet the dribble team. Um, you know, it's been a couple of years now since we've gotten together in person and I don't know, there's probably half the team I haven't met in person yet, which is, um, which is fine. You know, I think it's, I think it can be done. Um, but I also feel like, the week after that team trip, when you get everybody back together uh, after hanging out and eating and drinking, we kind of do this laptops down where we're just hanging out. We go to museums. We did a, a big scavenger hunt in, uh, in lower Manhattan. Last time we got together, we've done duck, duck boat tours. And so we just try to like eat, drink, have fun, just get to know each other as people, um, which really builds uh bonds so nothing really beats that that human connection i don't think but then when you go back into that ro remote environment after seeing each other and hanging out for a week uh everything is just like it glides everyone just grooves so i, I do think it's important I, I, I we've had a hotel block in vancouver since uh since like december 2019 and we keep <laughs> keep pushing it out, pushing it out. We're just waiting for borders to open and or people to feel safe to travel again. But um, yeah. So I think, you know, to answer your question, the remote thing, um, 
it works. Uh, we th there's a few things that that have worked well uh, for Dribble, and and this is really I think selfishly I've wanted to build a culture that of a company that I wanted to come to work for. And so, you know, I try not to take myself too seriously and, and have more of a fun and casual environment. Um, I've worked at larger organizations where people are very buttoned up and very professional and, and I, I hated that. And so, you know, I've tried to build a culture where people feel comfortable to wear pajamas to work and, and really come to work as their authentic self. And, um, you know, we, we try to allow the freedom for people to build their perfect day where if they have to go pick up their kids or, you know, coach soccer or pick up groceries or whatever, like, you know, we're, we're very kind of flexible from that approach. And, um, and I think all that is, is cemented on this foundation of trust, right? You have to trust your, your team to get their work done and not be overbearing and, and, uh, and heavy handed. And how you manage people and and then it works all right thanks a lot yeah uh, matt uh do you want to jump on sure thanks thanks so much for sharing your experience zach really appreciate it um question uh is more from a tech side so well kind of two sides so you said that you guys have not raised any vc or any funding and you guys have bootstrapped everything um what we're experiencing right now, I'm the founder of Gear Focus. So we're a marketplace for the camera gear for creatives. And I'm struggling with the tech side of things because we went from an MVP using an out of the box solution like a Shopify with some plugins and customizations to our own IP. And this is a whole new world without a CTO uh, for me. Uh, you guys, did you go through any of that in either of the companies? You know, no, because we've always had, um, we've always had a CTO as part of the journey along the way. And we've always been very tech focused. So, right. you know, we were, we're offset in terms of people on the, the product engineering side. So, I mean, I think that's, I mean, I would be, you know, I was a web, web designer at one point you know, many moons ago, but keep me away from code. Exactly. Uh, you know, so <laughs> no, I mean, I think you do need to find that, that co-founder and, and, you know, somebody who is going to own that piece of the business, you know, and that's just, I think advice for, for, you know, a good CEO is just a great delegator, right. And you have, and, and recruiter and finding great people to take those jobs that, you're not good at is, yep. is, is a big skill set. That's part of, you know, the most probably most important skill set of, of a CEO. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the bootstrap thing too. I mean, we've also been heavily focused on cash flow always. And so sure. that has helped us grow organically. And, um, and we really look at headcount as, you know, a weakness. Like my, I tell the team, like, you know, unless you're like bleeding and right. your hands are bleeding because you can't physically do the job anymore, then we'll hire. And, yep. But um, so we're, we're pretty, uh, pretty lean in that regards, but, um, but yeah, no, I mean, it's, it is kind of a cart before the horse, you know, until you have, you know, the cash flow coming in and you need that person. So you know, if it's a co-founder situation, if you're, I don't know how, what, what stage you're at, but if you're early, early, you know, it's an equity conversation. Um, and then, you know, you kind of just grow from there. And if you need capital, get, get the capital. I don't think there's anything wrong with venture. Right. Uh, you know, we've been courted by the top investors in the world and we've had term sheets and we've said no to them because, you know, we have a great, healthy, sustainable business and we don't need the cash and we're able to buy companies and with that cash and do all kinds of neat things. And, um, you know, so I think until we really want to like, if we decide we really want to throw fuel on the fire, then I think we would consider, you know, really kind of a late stage growth round at this point, but um, it, it just hasn't been a priority for us, but, you know, there's a ton of capital out there right now, uh, more than any time in history. So, you know, 
nothing wrong with partnering somebody with deep pockets. No, absolutely. We're going into a seed round right now, just to kind of answer that. Like we're state the stage that we're at. We're in a seed round. We got about fourteen thousand users, and we're growing at about six hundred fifty to seven hundred a month user base wise. So yeah, yeah. there's some really solid growth and really solid yeah. traction. And people are like, we've got commitments on our seed round already, but I still would love to find a co-founder <laughs> CTO. And that's that's a that's a yeah. tougher one to find. Well, so, they're out there. You know, I think yeah. I think it's about finding people who are, you know, find somebody who's passionate about photography and find somebody who's passionate yep. about building companies, right? And I think yep. you know, when when you're equity only too, like finding somebody who's had an exit or two behind their belt and they're getting bored, you know, yeah, hanging out at home. Yeah. Um, something new to do. Yeah. So they're, they're out there. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I actually had a question uh, for you myself, Zach. Um, yeah. And you know, that is uh, what, what's a uh, day like in the uh, life of the CEO of Dribble? <laughs> oh, um, yeah, lots of meetings. <laughs> I wish it wasn't that way, but um, no, I mean, I think it's, my role has evolved quite a bit, right? So when I, when I took over the company, you know, when it was eight people and, and, you know, I quickly scaled it up to probably 25 within the first three months after taking over the business. And, but I was still the bottleneck, like all the decisions had to run through me and like, but I was the only kind of executive at the point uh, at that point in time. And so, you know, I focused on bringing in leadership, right? I, I couldn't do this myself. I couldn't, you know, I had to figure out how do I scale myself. And so now at this point I've hired just amazing experienced seasoned leaders from, you know, monotype and Shutterstock and, and, you know, Getty images and like all these cool um, people with, with great experience and, and so I've kind of just let go of, of a lot of those decisions, right? And, you know, I leave it to the team to make um, a lot of decisions. You know, I, I'm still very much holding on to the strategy and the vision and the, and the mission. Like that's something I keep, keep close and, and beat like a drum. Um, I still care about recruiting. So I still interview everyone who is hired at Dribble or I, I don't get the interview with them. I, I meet them shortly after for coffee, for virtual coffee. Um, and then, um, and then you know, and this is kind of boring, but like capital allocation, you know, like capital management of like, you know, what do we do with all this, you know, with, with our cash? Do we grow the team? Do we, do we look at M&A? Do we um, reinvest in marketing or, or other growth channels? So there's this, there's this, you know, that's a big part of my my job at this at this point. But um, you know, if I if I look back twenty years from now or two years from now, whatever, um, at my tenure at Dribble, you know, I think the the one piece of my role that I'm super proud of is just the culture we built um, and the team. Like we just have this fantastic team and. Um, you know, it's, just, it's, the culture is because of the team. Right. And I think that's, um, that's something that's very important to me. And, you know, especially at this point in my career, right. I want to just have fun at work and enjoy the people I work with and, um, have a good time, you know, and it's, it's not about a job at that point, you know, it's kind of just what I do with my day. Yeah, certainly. Well, uh, yeah, that's a great way to uh, kind of wrap things up over here. And uh, we definitely appreciate, you know, you taking the time to join us and share all your yeah. awesome experience. We're uh, big fans of, you know, what you built with uh, Dribble. Um, last kind of question that I had for you, though, you know, if you were to kind of go back before you maybe uh, at the time before you uh, joined, you know, Creative Market, um, you know, with uh, marketplaces kind of specifically, you know, what would you tell yourself about them? They're hard. <laughs> um, no, I think, I think marketplaces are it's a beautiful business too like i think it's um and if you find the right one with you know and your your margins you know can be higher than most i mean the digital asset space is it's an incredible business um 
But, you know, you have to balance the two sides of the marketplace. You have to keep quality high. You have to keep fraud away. I mean, fraud has been, you know, a huge distraction over the years. And we could probably spin out a new startup just in the fraud technology we've developed over the years. Um, but no, I mean, I think... Again, I think marketplace is just a model. I think there's great SaaS businesses. I mean, we have, a, we have, you know, we have a marketplace. We have a SaaS product. We have um, an advertising business. So, so we're we're kind of multifaceted. Um, but the uh, the marketplace in particular, creator market in particular, because of the nature of that catalog, we see a direct correlation to. UGC that snaps tightly to traffic, which snaps tightly to revenue. We can go back a decade and it's just this, you know, this line that just goes up and to the right. So um, yeah, I think, I think marketplaces are, are amazing. If you're in a big market, I think that's important too. If you go to a niche, uh, it can bite you. Um, if your margins are too low, you won't be able to afford to sustain the overhead. Um, and you have to be able to, uh, not just attract customers, but you have to attract the supply side as well. So it's a double-edged sword in that regard, double the work. Yeah, certainly. Well, cool. Well, yeah, appreciate taking the time again, you know, well, once again, to uh, join us, um, you know, last yeah. but not least, uh, time for a quick plug. Where can we, uh, where can we keep up with you at? Um, you know what? I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm trying to abstain from social media, so, uh, no plug needed. <laughs> awesome. I'm, uh, I'm on Twitter. Zach four and five is my handle across all the things, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, uh, cure my addiction of social media. Yeah, cer certainly understand. So we'll, we'll include a link to uh, Dribble then. <laughs> Sounds great. Awesome. Yeah, well, thanks again for taking the time to join us. And uh, thanks for the uh, great questions, everyone.